The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Bill Gens with Top Solid USA. Um, it looks like we have some people logging in. I'm going to give everyone just a few minutes to get uh, logged in, and then we'll get started on today's presentation. Um, I suppose we can start talking about what we're going to be looking at. Um, today we're going to take a look at uh, pre-production machining into production machining and how we can reuse work that we've done in the pre-production uh, pre production mode and use it in production mode. For example, uh, on the screen here you guys are seeing the um, three setups that I'm going to be using, two vices and a rotary axis. And uh, <laughs> I just saw John's question. Hi back, John. Um, okay, so it's uh, it's 11 o'clock. Let's get started. For uh, people that come in late, they'll just join us then. And uh, as usual, we'll send the recordings out for all of this stuff. So uh, let's take a look at what I have on the screen here. Um, again, I have three different setups, right? I have vice one, vice two, and then I'm finishing everything in my rotary axis over here. If I run through some of the simulation of this, why not? Okay, so we're going to come in here. Machine's going to come down. It's going to do its thing. We are facing off the part. We're going to finish facing that part. We're going to go on to the next operation. So there's that. Now that's the finishing pass. I'm going to fast forward that. You'll see that it comes in over here, continues working, does its finishing pass, and then we move on to that part. So I'm using highly, highly, highly optimized um, or optimized sorting here. But where this all came from is what the story is that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to just go ahead and hit save on this. I'm going to back up. And you can see on my right here I have a project. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Top Solid, Top Solid is a project-based solution or a PDM-based solution. So all the data that we're working with is going to be... Uh, controlled through that PDM. If I look in my prep folder here, this is everything I did to get ready for today's presentation. And then we're going to do things a little bit live, okay? Uh, to begin with, I programmed my OP10. OP10 is just face this off, do these drillings in the back. Then I did my OP20, which is to machine this side of the part, do the drillings, okay? Then I did my OP30, which was to use a fourth axis and machine all the sides. Now, something unique I did here is I also am using, and I'll show it to you here really quick, a multi-step drill. And I'm going to show you how I create that drill and how we program with a drill like that. Okay? Now, from there, these are all what I call pre-production items. In other words, maybe we're prototyping these out, so we're going to run OP10 on our Haas, OP20 is going to be on a Fidel over there, and OP30 is going to be on a machine that's got a rotary axis until we've gotten this proven out and we got our production methods down. Now, where most softwares fall apart is when you want to tie all of that work together into this production mode. And I thought it'd be really, really cool to show everyone how you can take work that was done in other CAM files and bring it forth into a new CAM file. Okay? But that's going to be the end of today's presentation. So let's start from the very, very beginning. We're going to go over some basic programming along the way. So like I said, I'm going to save everything, we're going to close everything, and we're going to start from scratch. So here we go. In this case, I have my customer data. This is just going to be a little manifold. Okay, I'm going to right click on this, choose convert. You're going to see that this part comes in. It's just a widget part, it means nothing. Okay, we have some drillings in there. We have our multi-stepped holes to deal with. Um, that's pretty much that. So the first thing that we're going to want to do with this, because we know that we have a multi-step drilling to deal with here, is I'm going to prepare my tooling. Why not? So to prepare my tooling, I'm going to go to my tooling folder. And here you can see I have it done already here, but we're just going to create it again. I'm going to start by creating a new part. When I create this part, I'm going to call it multi-step drill two. 
Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to design this drill around the features of this part. But how to do that? Well, I'm going to use a magic trick. I'm going to go here to Top Solid uh, 7 icon, go to File, and I'm going to include what's called a background document. Now, the way this works is you got to have that background document open to make the reference. And like that, I can choose my manifold, and now it's included inside of this multi-step drill to file. But it's not included like an assembly inclusion or anything. It's, it's basically just referenced right where it was at in space in its document. So based on its absolute XYZ coordinate system, it brought it into here. If I look in my entities tree, and again, for people that aren't familiar with Top Solid, the entities tree's job is to organize all the content of a document for you. You'll see it added a backgrounds folder. If I expand this, there's my manifold. I can turn this on and off right there. Kind of neat. Now, how are we going to build this multi-step drill? Well, because I'm going to be doing a tool definition as well, I'm going to start with a frame. A frame is a, another word for a coordinate system. I'm going to say I want my frame zero to be there because this is where I'm going to drive this tool by is this point. X is to the right there. That's fine. Y, I'm going to say, needs to point up that way. That's perfect. Next, I'm going to go create a simple shape. And it's just going to be a cylinder by two points. I'm going to say, let's start there. And now let's maybe bring this down to there. Perfect. And again, you can set this to whatever size you want this to be to begin with. I'm going to click OK. Lastly, I'm going to subtract it. So I'm just going to subtract my manifold, which again was that reference document, from that shape. Now I can turn off that background document. And now I'm left with the drill. Now I'm also left with some things I don't need, so let's clean that up really quick. I'll go to Surfaces, uh, Remove. I'm going to go to Remove Body here, and I'll select that, get rid of that. And then I'm also going to go to Face Removal. I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to get rid of that. Kind of perfect. Next, I'm going to go back to shape, and I'm going to make some other quick modifications. I'm going to say that I want to pull this face up some distance, just something for now. I'm going to pull this face down some distance as well. Okay? And now, I'm going to go here and say I want to make a sketch, and we're going to make a circle, and we'll say it's an inch and three quarters, or pardon me, three eighths. And I'm going to trim by profile said shape. Get rid of the outside. That's going to leave me with my shank diameter plus the chamfer for the top of this multi-step drilling. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to build a sketch right here. And we're going to say this is going to be at some angle like so. We're going to add a dimension to this because I need to put a tip angle on, right? And then I'm also going to control that from there. Oh, let's see what three and a half inches looks like. Let's go ahead and turn on our manifold again. Yeah, that's good. I just want the drill long enough to break through into this hole some distance. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Uh, let's go ahead and trim by profile one more time. And we're going to go ahead and do a revolved trim. So we're going to revolve about that, trim away that side. Now we have the tip angle. One last sketch we're going to do. Actually, we have two more sketches to do. We're going to do one up here. This is just going to be a simple little rectangle. This will be the, oh, the shank of the tool, if you will. I'm going to say let's make this relative to that there. And now let's go ahead and add a little dimension. We're going to say this to our tip down here so we know what our overall length is going to be. Oh, we'll make it six inches. That's perfect. And we're going to revolve that as another shape. And we'll be done building this tool here in a second. And then you'll see how we use it inside a cam. It's kind of cool. But this is, you know, this is the engineering of manufacturing that we're doing right now, right? So lastly, I need to make one more sketch, and that's going to be to capture the spun profile of this special tool. So thankfully, I have a nice little tool for that. It's called Revolve Silhouette. Select the shape, select the axis. You can see a preview if you want. And that creates the entire revolved profile of that subtracted shape. And the reason we need that is because we're going to use it later on to define collision objects for our tool definition. Okay, before we get to tool definition, I'm going to quickly go ahead and offset Oh, this, based off of its axis there, I'm going to rotate the plane 90 degrees that way as well. Perfect. Now we have everything we need to create our tool definition. So let's do that. So I'm going to go up here to Tools, 
I'm going to go to functions and in here we have something called top solid cam wizard. If I go into my component wizard, I'm describing a type of cutter. It's a drill. It's a fancy twist drill. It can be used with any type of holder. First thing it needs to know is the main diameter we're driving by. You can drive by whatever diameter you want. Um, I don't actually remember how big this is, so I'm going to go here to measured value and I'm going to say I'm going to drive by that diameter. Okay. I'm going to say the total drilling depth on this is four inches. Tip angle is that. Now, this is where it gets to be interesting. This over length is from our driven point here to here. If we leave it at zero, that means that the software cannot automatically adjust for this. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go measure. Let's go to analyze right in the middle of the command. I'm going to say I want a coordinate measurement based off of that zero to that point right there. And that's three and a half inches. Perfect. So I'm going to come into here, set that to three and a half inches. Your flute length can be the same as your drilling depth. That's fine. And then what type of material is this made out of? That's for your feed and speed calculation. And finally, where is that driven frame? That driven frame is right there. Next, it needs to know the tooling frame. This is how it gets attached to a holder. That's going to be that frame. And then finally, it needs the sections for collision detection. It's going to be that section and that section. Okay. Now it's describing our cutting edge origins. The only thing I'm going to do on a tool like this, typically a drill, you could drive by the tip or the center. On these special tools, I put the driven points for both in the same place because you're never going to drive this tool by more than one possible location. And the reason for that is because we want it to take into consideration always that over length here. Okay? Give it its name, and you're basically done. The only thing I got to do is add shape two into my representations that's so that it shows up in the assembly. Done. Now, just to finalize this, and then we'll get on to programming parts. Let's go build a quick assembly. In this assembly, this is going to be our multi-step drill two. And we're going to go to tools, functions, cam wizards. And notice now in the assembly document, there's an assembly of machining component wizard. We can double click here and we can start adding tooling. So I'm going to start with my holder. Maybe I'll use this holder here. Why not? And now I'm going to add the tool that I want. So let's go into here, go to cutters, let's look for drills. I'm going to turn that off so we're just looking inside this document and I'm going to look for twist drills. And in here, you're going to see multi-step drill two. And you notice that frame that I described for how it attaches to the holder, there it is. And now we're done. Give it its name and this tool is ready to be used. Nice and easy. Once you define it once, it's in your library forever and off you go. Now, we have our tooling done. That's awesome. I also, ahead of time, I have built my little goofy fixture here. If there's time before we call this done, I'll go ahead and uh, show you guys how I drew the fixture. There's some fun little tricks I can show you in there as well. But for now, let's just focus on the OP10 and OP20 programs. I want to program the first operation, the second operation, and let's see where we're at at that point. So to do this, I'm going to start by saying I want to take my manifold and make a machining document out of it. Now, what I could do is go straight to machining, but then it's up to the software to define my stock for me. So instead, what I'm going to do is go to machine part setup. When I go to machine part setup, I'm going to choose blank document, and here, I'm going to come into the software and tell it how big the stock is. Now, in this case, I'm going to let it use an eighth inch per side. If you look, the stock size here is six and a quarter by four and a quarter by two and a half. You could adjust these values if you wanted. Maybe in Y, you know it's going to be four and three eighths. Cool. Set that. It'll adjust the offsets on either side. Doesn't matter to us. Green check. And now that part is ready for machining. Because remember, machine part setups are where you get to tell Top Solid what the part to cut is and what the finish is. From here, what I'm going to do is send that into a machining document. Now, to begin with, I'm not going to use any special machine. I'm going to use generic machines because I'm just prototyping right now and I haven't decided yet which machine 
this is actually going to run on. It's going to run on one of my three axis mills. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to work with uh, machine work stock. It's a faceted type of stock. First thing I want to do is position this. Now, the part goes into positioning mode. When I'm working on universal machine depth like this, it throws a plane on the screen to show me the orientation of X and Y. Picture that plane as the table of your machine. I know that I want that face in contact with the table there, but flipped the other way. Then I'm going to square off that face with my X axis and that face with my Y axis. Perfect. Notice it went from purple to blue. That means the part is fully constrained. Go ahead and validate. Now, notice there's a G54 on the screen. Now, why is there a G54 there? Because in my tools options, I have defined how I like to have my work offset set by default. Now, of course, you can go here, edit this at any time, turn off automatic, change the point to wherever you want. Maybe you're angry at your setup guy. You want to make his life difficult. Throw it over there. Why not? Okay. So let's start facing. I'm going to go here, right mouse button click, and go to end milling. Now, when I go to end milling, the software is going to find the area to machine automatically for me. That's kind of cool. But, you know, I machine a lot of parts, and I find that when I face off whatever this material is, let's call it aluminum, when I face off aluminum, I pretty much always program it the same way day in and day out. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my favorites. This is one of many ways to automate things in Top Solid. And in here, you'll notice I have a routine called facing plus 10 thousandths. And to me, that's my shorthand to say I'm going to leave 10 thousandths of stock. So let's go ahead and select that. Notice when I select that, I have tool path. Not only do I have tool path, it grabbed the tool I want. Not only does it do that, it also set my fees and speeds the way I wanted them set. Kind of cool. All I need to do, click OK. We go into our first level of simulation. Now, I'm going to come up here. I'm going to edit that operation name. I'm going to say facing plus 0 0.01 stock. Okay? Now, in all reality, I'm going to use the same tool path, same tool, but get rid of that stock. And maybe I'm going to change my fees and speeds slightly. Why not? Maybe I'm going to give it a little bit more and a little bit less there. And we're done. And now this one, I'm going to say facing to finish. So now I have those first two operations complete. Awesome. What are we going to do next? Now, next I have these little pads here. These little pads need to be uh, milled out. Um, I'm going to tell you that on the little part print I have on my desk here, those little pads have no tolerances to them. They're just a relief to make sure there's no burrs. Okay? So I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to go here to side milling. I'm going to go grab, oh, let's go grab a smaller tool. How about we look for a quarter inch end mill? Now, what I'm doing here is looking in my library to see if I have a quarter inch tool defined, and I do. So we'll go ahead and use that. I'll go ahead and set my feeds and speeds right away. Maybe I want to run this at 275 surface feet and at 3,000 chip load. Perfect. Jet coolant. The other thing that I want to do on this, I don't want to just plunge down. Instead, I'm going to use helical mode. This way I'm helically entering, getting rid of everything. I'm going right to finish on all the values because, again, it's a non-tolerant feature. And here, I'm just going to go ahead and select each of the faces that I want to apply this to. Why not do them all in one shot? Done. Again, for those of you new to Top Solid, you'll notice the stock is being updated dynamically as we go. From here, let's do the drillings next. To begin with, I'm going to start by just selecting this hole here, go to drilling, I'm going to choose hole machining. I could click a button and have it find everything, but because there's just a handful of holes, I'm going to use this opportunity to show everyone how to program drillings simplistically. So here we have our kind of machining. I'm going to come up here and double click on the kind of machining icon and change to centering. This drives the type of tool selection I have. Maybe you're a center drill person, maybe you're a spot drill person. I'm going to look for spot drill. Now, some of the things I've been doing here but not explaining, I toggle this button back and forth while I'm programming. When you see this icon, that means it's going to create a new tool. So if I double click right now, it's going to allow me to build dynamically a new tool. Let's say that's what we want. I'm going to say I want a nice 
half inch 90 degree spot drill. Okay. Why not? That looks good. Maybe the holder is inch and a quarter and maybe it's two inches long like so. That looks lovely. And then if I come into here, maybe the stick out by default should be one inch. Nice. And now I have my spot drill. If I were to use the other icon, this, that means it's going to look at my library instead. So it's just a toggle. Depends on how you like to program. From there, we have picked that hole down there to spot. The software found the diameter of the hole, which looks to me to be a tapped hole, and it's proposing a print diameter. Works for me. Let's go ahead and set our feeds and speeds right away. Again, the software likes to learn from you. So as you go, if you start setting feeds and speeds on this thing, it's going to remember the settings you use, and it's going to try its best to apply them for you. Go to geometry. I can say go find all the similar holes. And like that, those two holes are spotted. And again, it goes into simulation. Now, I want to use the same tool path. So I'm going to copy paste it, go to geometry. I'm going to delete these faces. I'm going to go select this face instead and do a search. Nice. And that one's done. Another way I could do it is I could simply drag and drop the tool path onto the feature I want to drive it by. And like that. Now we have a tool path here. Now this tool happens to be the same diameter as that hole, so it can't find a print diameter. So we need to give it our own centering depth. I'm going to say, let's just center this down an eighth of an inch. Awesome. Like that, now everything is done. Now for those keeping track at home, I did these as separate operations because they're separate drillings. If you wanted to center them all or tip drill them all at once, of course you can do that. Just select the holes to machine. Next, let's go ahead and do the drilling, shall we? So if we zoom in here, we can see here's our tapped hole. I'm going to select that cylinder right there. Go to drilling, hole machining. That's our 201 diameter. Let's go look in our library for that. So I'm going to switch to library mode, double click on pocket four, have it look everywhere. And lo and behold, there are a bunch of 201 drills that I've used in previous demonstrations. So we're going to go pick one. That one looks good. Now, so far, we've been doing stuff pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to say, you know what, it's running a little hot for me. I like that better. Good. Now, when we drill this hole, you know, it's a 201 diameter drill. I don't want to just jam it in there. I want to do a pecking or a clearing cycle. So I'm going to come into our drilling here, and I'm going to turn on a clearing cycle. Or, if you want, a pecking cycle. Nice and easy. And then we'll come over to here, find its mate. There it is. And we're done. Kind of cool. We're almost done with this setup, so let's go ahead, drill, drill. This is another way to select. I'm going to control select them. And again, my goal here is just to show you lots of different ways to get through this. Let's go ahead and look in our library. Again, we're going to look everywhere, but I don't want to be stuck with just the quarters. Instead, what I want is, oh, let's say. How about a 15 60 fourths? I'm going to drill this undersize. Yeah, there we go. There's one. Good. I want to peck drill this. Notice I'm going to drag and drop. And I'm going to use very, very similar fees and speeds, so I may as well drag and drop there too to copy those settings. And like that, now that, that hole is programmed. Finally, let's go ahead and drill this hole. I'm going to go to drilling, hole machining. This one is just a straight, simple hole, so I'm going to go ahead and look in my library. Do I have one? And the answer is yes. Let's get one with a holder. That's always more entertaining. And go. Now, lastly, we have to tap, tap, ream, ream. So let's tap first. We could thread mill this. We could tap it. For today's demo, I'm just going to use tapping. So I'm going to come through here. Uh, we're going to go change to tapping up here on the top right. And let's go ahead and look in our library for a tap. And here we're going to look for quarter. Let's turn off those. There we go. There's our quarter 20s. If we look in our feeds and speeds, for example, you can see that the pitch is passed in there. You can set your RPM or however you want to drive this tapping. And away you go. Now, again, for those of you keeping track at home, another thing that I want to point out is 
Have you noticed that I haven't really set any depths of cut manually? Everything is being pulled from that solid model, which is the advantage of programming to a solid model. Let's do the same thing over here. I'm going to go to drill, drill, hole machining. Oop, looks like I missed my other one. No big deal. And we're going to switch here to reaming. Now, in the reaming command, you can choose a reamer or a boring bar. Depends on what you want. The choice here is what chooses and drives the G-code that Top Solid will spit out. So here, I'm going to go ahead and search for just a regular good old-fashioned reamer. And here we have one. Oop, there we go. Again, fees and speeds are set. Off we go. So in the past few minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, I have programmed the 11 operations for our OP10 setup. Let's hit save once, and then we're going to take a look at a few things. First thing I want to do, I'm going to find this over here, and I'm going to name this OP10. The reason I'm going to do that is because it is our first operation. Now, when you're done programming or at any point during programming, you can, of course, go into verify, hit play, and you can watch the verification. For example, here we'll hit go, and here this is going to go ahead and run through its simulation of removing material. Now, at the end of the day, all we're really after is making sure that there's no collisions, right? So you can watch the animation. If there's a collision, it's going to yell at you. Or if you want to work a little bit faster, you can watch in turbo mode. And like that, there is the finished program part. You'll notice there's no dark red shown because the dark red is showing you there's collisions. However, my little collision icon didn't light up up here. And let's find out why. On my centering operation here, there seems to be a gouge. And that makes complete sense because I told it to center deeper to leave a little chamfer. But what's neat about this clash list here is we take the guessing game out of where the collision is. We even show you an arrow saying, hey, look, it's right here. Kind of neat. So we're good there. Let's go ahead and exit out of here. And op 10 is ready to go. Now, while we're on op 10, let's go ahead and begin our documentation of op 10. Let's go here to Machine standard templates, I'll go to Imperial, operation with drawings, why not? And now the software is going to make a setup sheet for me, and it's going to show us in that setup sheet the total cycle time, number of operations, where our zero is, a picture of the tool path, picture of your tool, the name of your tool, the number of your tool, the diameter, the stick out distance, your speeds and feeds settings, everything, and it's doing it for every single operation. Kind of cool. Let's save that. I'm going to close that. And I'm even going to make a new subfolder here in our machining. And we'll call this documentation. Because we're probably going to want to use this documentation when we're finished. Now, from here, let's go ahead and do op, uh, op 20. Now, op 20 is going to be the exact opposite side of this. Okay? So let's do op 20. And here, again, I'm going to show you some magic. What I want to do is I want to take everything I've done with the updated stock and carry it forward to OP20. So to do that, all I'm gonna ask the software to do is take this machining and send it into another machining document. Kinda cool. By doing that, it's doing a part repositioning. I'll just validate. And now I'm gonna position this part how I would have it positioned for OP2. And all I'm doing, same as I did on the first one, I'm just aligning things with my table, my X and my Y. And now I'm done. Kind of cool. And off we go machining again. So let's go ahead now and go to end milling. And here, instead of picking a tool, let's pick our favorites again. Let's start with that one. That's going to face that off. Right? I'm going to do the same thing as before. Now I could have actually set this comment to come out this way always as well in my uh, favorite. I just forgot to. So facing plus 0.0. 01, copy paste, modify, stock to leave, done. So top of the part is now good to go. Facing to finish. Now let's go ahead and machine down to this level. So now I'm going to right click, go to end milling. This is a little bit more custom now. We have some uh, ribs to machine through. This is what uh, it could reach with this half inch tool. 
which I suppose is okay. But I'm going to say, you know, it's just aluminum. I can get away with it. I'm going to go ahead and go straight to my quarter inch end mill again. So let's go here. Let's look in our library and let's see if we can find a quarter inch end mill. So let's go to here and search and look at that. There's a quarter inch end mill right there. Perfect. Now it's going to take it a second because the software is now going to look at the quarter inch end mill and regenerate all the tool path for you. One of the dynamic and very, very cool features of Top Solid is that in all your two and a half axis operations, we try to give you real time feedback as much as possible. Some cases in very complex parts, maybe it's irritating to wait for this. If that's the case, you can turn off the automatic regen up here in the top right corner of your screen. But other than that, you can see it made the tool path. We're ready to rock. We can go look at our speeds and feeds if you want. You know what? I'm going to set that a little bit hotter. I want some more RPM because I'm going to get more aggressive on my chip load. That'll be wonderful. And off we go. Now, at this point, the software is going to update the stock model, and we're going to move on to the next set of operations, which is to finish those walls. Now, to finish the walls, all I'm going to do, right-click on one and go to side milling. The software is going to assume we're finishing, so stock's at zero, zero. And you know what? For this, not a high tolerance area. I'm just going to do this in one depth of cut. And I'm going to bang through and try to get all of these faces best I can in one operation. Kind of perfect. You'll notice the software is choosing to lead in and off, off the part there. I don't have to tell it to do that. It's going to look for the best possible place to lead in and lead out. That's done. Now we're ready to machine in the center. Now in the center, this is nothing special. It's nothing crazy. Okay, it's just a couple of features. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to end milling. Now here I wanted to pick our quarter inch end mill because that's what we had in the spindle. I'm going to switch back to our half inch end mill. Okay. And you know what? We're not going that deep, so I'm just going to let this thing machine it in one pass. So you notice it's automatically helically down because it has to. It's entering material. We're going to go ahead and validate that. And I'm going to take this same tool path, drag and drop it onto the level below, which now machines that level. Now the last thing we need to do is finish it. So let's go to side milling. Again, one pass is all we need. Side milling, side milling. Life is good. And finally, we got to do some drilling, right? So let's go to hole machining here. And here I'm just going to go straight to drilling. I think you guys get the idea. You can put in a uh, tip drill, do whatever you need to do. So let's go find the correct drill with a holder again, because holders make things more realistic. You have your fees and speeds set, and off you go. Okay, so now, in about the last 20, 25 minutes, we have gone from talking about what this project is to now programming completely Operation 10 and now Operation 20, which, by the way, I forgot. Let's go name this Operation 20. Perfect. Now, from here, we want to talk about programming Operation 30. Now, Operation 30, the intent is that we're going to program this on our fourth axis. So imagine, if you will, you're going to have it mounted on your fourth axis. We're going to do the machining, rotate, machining, rotate, machining, rotate. So we're going to prep to do that in a sec. Before I do, because again, documentation is important, I'm going to have the software create the setup sheet for Op20. Perfect. We can close all that. I'm going to put that one in my documentation folder, come back to it in a little bit. And now let's do Op30. Now, while I'm programming Op30, instead of telling you step by step what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk theory of machining now. Okay? So in Op30, um, again, we're doing the fourth axis, right? Another way to look at what I'm doing here, maybe you have a rush job. You have a couple of top solid users. Instead of having one user program everything, they could actually divide and conquer. In other words, you could have one user program op 10, one user program op 20, one user program op 30, and then have a final user put them all together at the end. And that's going to be what I'm going to show you at the end of this demonstration. It's going to be cool. Now, before I can program a fourth axis, another thing to know about Top Solid. Top Solid is critical about the type of machine you're programming on. In other words, if there's no rotary axis in the definition of the machine, we forbid rotary motion. Okay? So, 
the machine I'm using right now is just a simple XYZ machine. I want to change this to be an XYZ machine with a rotation. So I'm going to go here. These are just generic machine defs, just to allow me to get my work done. I'm going to come here and I'm going to go ahead and position this now. Now, when you're using the generic machine def like this, this X, Y, Z, A axis, A rotates about the X axis. So what I'm going to do is take the center of my part and, whoops, missed it, and put it right on my X axis. Okay? I'm going to flip it over that way because on the machine that's the way it's going to be. And then from here, what I want to do is I'm going to orient this to this. That just makes them parallel. And then finally, I'm going to take this front face to that axis. Pretty cool. Now that that's done, it's going to create my zero up here. In this case, I want my zero to be back here because that's on my fixture point. Okay? Perfect. Now we're ready to program. Now, to show you guys other ways to program parts, I'm going to come to here and I'm going to say, you know what? These two operations, I'm going to just right click them and copy them. And then I'm going to come over to here. And right click in here, and I'm going to choose paste. Do you want to copy the cutting conditions? Absolutely. Facing plus 10 is right there. Guess what it just did? It just applied the exact same tool paths, cut strategies, speeds and feeds, everything to this new geometry. Notice, by the way, that was the stock left because we finished everything, right? So notice. This is truly machining to where the stock is. This is the advantage of carrying that stock forward to the next operation, because then you can be really, really accurate, spend less time cutting air, more time making money. Now that that's done, and I'm on a fourth axis, I wanna do all my roughing. And yes, I am truly using Windows drag and drop to just take the same toolpath strategy and assign it to each of these new geometries. I'm then going to reorder things because I want the finishing to happen last. Let's go ahead and recalculate that. And off we go. And now we can start finishing. So we'll go here and we'll spin backwards. Why not? Flip this up and off we go. So now we have all those faces done. One and done. It's fantastic. Now, remember that multi-step drill. We're going to hit that now in this discussion. First, though, I do like to tip drill things. Just makes me feel good. So I'm going to go here, select my hole, switch to tipping. Again, you could have copied the tipping operation from another file. Why not? Instead, I'm just going to go grab the tool again because I started down this path, pun intended. Let's find out. All right, so turn off operation filter because I want to just grab my half inch tip drill. There we go. We have our feeds and speeds. Should be okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that, although that's a little slow. Let's do that. Okay. Now, we've done our tipping. Oops, one more thing. We want to set our cutting depth to be something like that. There we go. So now you can see the tipped operations. And now from here, I'm going to use that same drag and drop technology into here. And I'm going to flip this over. Now when you use drag and drop, it's only going to let you apply it to one hole at a time. Okay? So once I drag and drop to that side, I'm just going to come over and add one of their pieces of geometry. I'm going to point out something fun here as well. Notice here, I didn't care which cylinder I selected. I selected this one down here, but notice where the tipping operation is. Drilling is always looking at the stock. Okay, so because there's stock up there, it's going to calculate the tipping starting point based on the current stock model. Now, we're nearly done. Let's go to here. And we'll drill to drill that. That's perfect. Now let's talk about drilling one of these things. It doesn't matter which one you start on. I'm going to start on this one. That's my A0 side. And I'm just going to pick this hole or this face right here. I'm going to go to drilling, and I'm going to choose hole machining. Now, we need to go grab our tool, right? So let's go look in our library for a twist drill. We're in our web demo thing, because I put these tools in here. Otherwise, you'd point to the library you want. This is the one we defined together, right? So let's go ahead and grab 
the one with the holder right there. Perfect. Now, from here, we set some feeds and speeds for this. Uh, I'm sure that looks good. We can go a little bit hotter than that. Let's go two and a half. And then let's go a little bit hotter. I like it. Okay, now, how are we going to drive this? First, I'm going to turn off my tool for a second. I'm going to go here to settings. And I'm going to drive by a point. My point is going to be right there. If I turn my tool back on, life is good. Maybe we want to also uh, use a clearing cycle on this because it's, a, again, a pretty deep hole. So we use a clearing cycle, and off we go. Now, here's what happens. So the tool's coming up. Let me uh, stop this, restart it, and I'll pause. I'm going to step through it. So we're wrapping down from tool change. Okay. If I hit next again and on my keyboard, now I'm at my rapid plunge clearance, and now it's going to drill. And it's taking into consideration that over length that we defined in our tool definition. So taking the time to define your tooling properly actually makes programming a heck of a lot faster, doesn't it? I don't have to worry. I'm just driving the tool by where I want to drive the tool by, and off we go. Let's do it one more time. Again, I'm going to pick here. I'll go to drilling. You could have copy and pasted. You could have done lots of different things. Okay. I'll go into here. I'm going to switch to point. We're going to pick our point right there, and off we go. Those holes are done. Okay. Now, at this point, we're uh, nearing 40 minutes into this presentation. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on now to the next phase of this discussion. If there's time, I'll come back and we'll program the rest of the drillings. But at this point, I think you guys get the idea. Top Solid's actually uh, pretty good at what it does. Let's go ahead and hit save. Let's go ahead and, oops, let's do this as well. Make that our op 30. Okay. Perfect. And now from here, Let's go ahead and create the production version of this. So when we create the production version of this, and again, I'm just going to finish my documentation while we're talking here. The production version, this is what I see happen when I go out and talk to, to prospects and customers out there. People start one way. They program up the part to get through the, you know, the rough first few uh, parts and the prove outs and everything. But then when they get into production, maybe we're going to, you know, maybe they run the first 10 or 100 of these things on three different machines, but now in production mode, they want to run it on one machine. And when they run it on that one machine, instead of reusing what's already been done, they oftentimes start over with their programming. Well, I'm going to show you in top solid that you don't actually have to start over. We can use everything that we've done so far for the production version. Here's how that's going to work. I'm going to start a new machining. This time, I am going to use a template. It's going to be done on my Haas VF2. My Haas VF2 has my fourth axis on it, has my two vices on it. Everything in here is good to go. I'm going to check one quick thing. Yep, that's what I thought. Sorry, I forgot to do this. My When I loaded my uh, vices, I loaded them as fixed objects so they won't follow the table. So I just want to fix them real quick. Okay, so we have our part. What I want to do next is I want to bring in my manifold to recreate op 10 here. This is the best part. I'm going to go here to my op 10 cam file, and I'm simply going to drag and drop the cam file into this cam file. And you're given a special command here. It recognizes that you're bringing something that's fully programmed into another machining document, and it's giving you the option to reposition the part, for a new operation or do an NC part inclusion, which says I want to include this cam file, its part, its stock model, and all of its tool path into this cam file. Yes, this could be even put on a different machine. I want to bring all those operations. And now we're going to take that face, put it on the vise there. You could change the orientation of the part if you really wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Okay, that's going to be there, that's going to be there, that's going to be here. Now, I'm going to cheat as well and say that that's going to be there also because I know the next one's going to be there. And there is that. It's hooked up to the table. Perfect. And guess what? We now have 
all of those operations inside this new CAM file. Pretty cool. Let's keep going. I'm going to take op 10 now and include this. Same, same. Now I want to take, sorry, the bottom face there to that face there. I'm going to take that to there. And let's say, uh, you know what? Let's do it this way. Let's take this face to that face. Perfect. And again, nope, not on the rotary yet. We're on the table. Perfect. Now that's bringing in that whole program. Very cool. Next, our fourth axis. Remember I said earlier I made a special fixture, right? So I'm going to bring in that fixture now. Let's include it. By doing it as an inclusion, it just means it's being brought into the assembly, but it's not actually going to be considered for machining. So I'm going to pop that there. Bring that back a little bit. We'll take that face, pop it in there like so, and then let's go ahead and orient that to that. Perfect. And this is going to be part of that. And this will be important because our OP30 has to be mounted on the fourth axis, right? So I'm including, including the fixture that I'm actually going to hold it on when I do this. Here we go. So now let's take that face, pop it on there. I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, let's take our tapped holes to there. Okay, let's flip this up a little bit so we can see. Let's take our leader pin, or not leader pin, pardon me, just our pinholes to there. And that's attached to the rotary. Now, why is all this important? By doing it this way, not only are you getting to reuse everything, and I mean everything, but you can also now sort everything however you want. For example, right now, here's the facing operations down here, right? If I zoom on down, these are the facing operations on this part here, okay? So if I was to go and run this one, and we want to run it, notice you see the simulation of the part turning, tools approaching, and off it goes. But maybe what we want to do is this. Maybe I want to take all tool ones, right? And I want to move them up the list. Because all of tool ones are going to run first. Awesome. Let's go grab our tool ones from here as well. And we'll move those up here. And we'll put them eh, right there. Now, what I want you to notice is notice there's no massive rebuild time. The reason there's no massive rebuild time is because all of these operations are actually driven by their parent documents. Changing the order doesn't change the toolpath in this case. It just changes when we call the toolpath. Okay? Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting, you see these green dots. The green dots tell me that these operations are associative back to the parent documents. However, I could come into my production file and say, you know what, let's break the associativity of that one. Now that green dot goes away, and I could come in here and I could change something. Let's say, um, maybe we want this to be 10% step over. Material's running really hard, okay? That does cause a rebuild, so we rebuild. Now you can see, rebuilds are fast, it's just checking a few things. Now, what's interesting there is we made this change for production, but now we come back and say, you know what? At the end of production, you know what? Okay, we got new material in. It's not running as hard anymore. I wonder if I can change it back. Well, because it's top solid, of course you can. You can say repair associativity, and it returns to the way it was programmed, again, in those parent documents. Kind of cool. Again, the goal here is we programmed some parts, we imported the data, we programmed the three different ops for it, we programmed it for pre-production mode first, and then we took that pre-production program and turned it into a production program in a matter of a few minutes. It didn't take us three days to do it, we didn't have to reprogram everything, we didn't start over. We just did our job. 
lastly, because you know, proof is in the pudding, right? If we go here and generate some G code, just let it do that. We'll come in here and I'll just use my Haas, why not? Good enough. Oop. And that's opening up on my other machine, or pardon me, my other monitor. Let me go grab it for you guys. There you go. Here's your basic tool list there, and G code is off and running. Not too shabby, huh? Now, we have our G code. We talked about documentation, right? Well, Right now, the documentation came from three different setups. We have our OP10, our OP20, and our OP30. So how can we create a global document now for these operations? Well, we have a special document in here called the draft bundle. In that draft bundle, we can include, for example, all the pages, like so. And again, all the pages, like so. Notice what it's doing back here? It's adding every single one of these into a booklet format, okay? And if I go here, I can see the booklet of all of my setups. I can go straight to one to continue documenting because maybe on this one here, we wanted to point out something. So if I double click, I can be working on that page of that document and say, okay, this is important. Um, this is gonna be a dimension that we're gonna say is just reference, okay? We'll pop that there and then we're gonna turn that off and I'm gonna dimension from here to there and here to here. And now this is part of that change. It's in here. You could print this all off, create a PDF out of it, do with it what you want. But hopefully everyone that's been in attendance today has seen what workflow can look like through a product like Top Solid, where you have the integration of everything from data management through part design, fixture design, into machining, documentation of machining, and then that final assembled version for the production version of the machining. So at this point, we have a few minutes left. Is there anyone that has any questions they'd like to ask? If so, feel free to type those in right now and I'll do my best to answer some of them. Okay, I don't see uh, don't see anyone raising their hand to ask a question. So at this point, I'll say uh, thank you for taking the time to have a look at Top Solid today. And again, this is going to be uh, this recording will become available to download uh, probably in about an hour or so once it's done compiling. I uh, wish everyone a good day and hope you enjoyed what I had to show you. No, oh, hold on. There's one question just came in. All right. So what's your question, uh, James? How is nested-based programming different? Um, so if you're gonna do nesting-based programming, there's a couple of different ways to do it in Top Solid. Uh, the first is program a part like we did, okay? Um, for example, this operation here is programmed. I can then Add, uh, have Top Solid start a nesting document um, somewhere in here. And we can go ahead, there it is, and we can go ahead and include that machining file, for example. Okay. Uh, nesting upper, oh, sorry, I don't have the, the right things referenced in here. You can go ahead and include that nesting into, or that machining into the nesting file and say, I want to cut 10 of these parts out of this size material. 
and then the software will automatically do the nesting, rotate the parts, do what it has to. That's, a, that's one way. Another way would be to first nest your parts and then take the entire nest into machining and program it after. It just depends on how you want to drive your tool path. Anybody else? Or James, do you have any follow-ups? All right, perfect. All right, then with that, we'll say that, uh, again, everyone, thank you for your time today and have a pleasant day.